Emory, and then went to Boston City Hospital, and then to the Johns Hopkins Hospital for internal medicine uh, training. And then, uh, as he said, uh, came to a fork in the road and moved to the National Institutes of Health, where he uh, did training in pathology. Later, I think as many people know, he was the head of the uh, uh, pathology uh, branch of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute uh, for many years before uh, departing and taking his current position at Baylor. I'm sure many people also know him as the uh, uh, editor of the American uh, uh, Journal of Cardiology, and he's also the editor of the Baylor University Medical Center Proceedings. Um, he's uh, very well known uh, for uh, writing about atherosclerosis in general, uh, as well as uh, various clinical uh, pathologic uh, correlations uh, in cardiovascular disease. And he's here today to speak uh, about a very interesting topic, uh, which he's titled uh, Shifting from Decreasing Risk to Actually Preventing and Arresting Atherosclerosis. So, Dr. Roberts, thank you for coming. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruffner. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. I like this uh, city. I remember reading uh, not too many years ago an article on the three best cities to live in the USA and one of them was Pittsburgh and uh, that was after all the smokestacks were cleaned up and uh, that always impressed me. It's certainly a beautiful uh, uh, place. I'll go ahead with the first slide. I also want to thank uh, Merck for, uh, uh, for making this uh, trip from Dallas possible. Now this point uh, this is a coronary artery, and if you just look next to the person next to you, one of you is going to die because of uh, cardiovascular disease. Thank you, sir. Uh, I got about 15 of these things at home, and I never remember to bring one with me. Uh, I had to buy a little box with, you know, pins in order to get them organized. Um, Interestingly, looking at this coronary artery, people talk about uh, the, the, the vulnerable plaque, uh, the lipids. Uh, where is all the lipid? Um, this is calcium here, and all this brown stuff is fibrous tissue. But the amount of lipid, that's the lipid right there. That's the lumen right there. That's all the lumen left. That's a little, maybe there. Uh, lipid is not the biggest deal in coronary arteries in patients with symptomatic atherosclerosis. Scar tissue is a big deal. Uh, scar tissue makes up about 75% of the plaque. Uh, so I'm not much of a believer in all this vulnerable plaque stuff uh, that we hear so much about. Uh -oh. uh, now, one of the things that's appealed to me is that maybe I want to turn his life just a little bit more down, um, is that we don't have to have atherosclerosis. Uh, uh, I live in Dallas, Texas. There are two Baylor's Institute, one's in Dallas and one's in Houston. Uh, I like to define the familial variety of atherosclerosis like uh, Brown and Goldstein do, and they define it by those people who have an inadequate number of LDL receptors in the liver. And that's only about one out of 500 people. So the rest of us, we are responsible uh, for the plaques in our arteries. Now the reason I show this one, slide here, this is the left anterior descending at sight of maximal narrowing. In other words, it's normal. This is animal thickening here, about the same thickness as the media. This is a worldwide lesion, occurs all around the world, everybody, it has nothing to do with lipid levels. Uh, it's apparently the response of the artery to pressure. But in, in, only in societies where lipids are elevated uh, do we have uh, uh, additional animal thickening. This particular patient was 103 years of age. My point is, is that atherosclerosis is not a degenerative disease as I was taught in medical school. We don't have to have it uh, just because uh, we reside on, on the planet Earth. Uh, 
Let me show you a few uh, morphology slides. But what I'm going to talk about is uh, is uh, cross-sectional area narrowing. The intravascular ultrasonic images, of course, use cross-sectional area narrowing. And geography uses diameter reduction, so you're comparing an area of narrowing to an adjacent area, which is assumed to be normal. So this is diameter reduction. This is cross-sectional area narrowing. One of the striking things uh, that the engineers have taught us is that uh, if you divide this circle into four quadrants, it has to be, you have to fill up over three quadrants before flow through that artery or through that tube, through that pipe is actually diminished. Um, so maybe our challenge is, challenge is not necessarily the elimination of atherosclerosis, but certainly the limiting of it to less than 75% cross-sectional area narrowing. Now in general, a 75% cross-sectional area narrowing is roughly equivalent to a 50% diameter reduction. So when I say 75% in the next few slides, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about if you want to uh, uh, articulate that with an angiogram. Now this is some data uh, collected by myself and colleagues when I was at NIH. We studied a lot of patients with acute myocardial infarction, which was fatal. Uh, this data is based on those with their first infarct, first infarct, which was fatal. And we, take, we took these coronary arteries off the heart intact, uh, very carefully, uh, decalcified them, and then divided, fixed them in formaldehyde and divided them into little bitty five millimeter segments. Now, if you want to say some a process is diffuse, you've got to study the whole thing uh, in order to say it's uh, diffuse. If somebody says, well, this is a representative section, well, to be representative, you've got to, take, you've got to know what every one is uh, to determine what the representative one is. At any rate, we take them off the heart and then very gently divide them into five millimeter segments. Now, not squashing them where you crack a plaque, uh, but, but very gently changing the blade uh, five or ten times per, per case. And in general, that produces about five, 55 little five millimeter segments per heart, 55. And the question asked here was how many of those segments, uh, this study is based on about 30 patients, how many of those segments were narrowed to these four categories of narrow? And it turned out, and this was present in all of the subsets, about a third of these segments were narrowed over 75% in cross-sectional area by plaque alone. Now these are patients with fatal coronary disease. Their coronary event was acute myocardial infarction, and it was their first event. We knew it was their first event because they had no scars in the heart. Uh, so about a third of the coronary tree in these patients presenting with acute myocardial infarction was severely narrowed by plaque alone. Another nearly 40% were narrowed 51 to 75%, 23%, 26 to 50, and only 5%, 25% or less, and not a single one was normal. None, zero. When you, when you see that patient in the emergency room with acute myocardial infarction, uh, uh, I can tell you for sure that if that patient's over 30 years of age, then not a single one of those five millimeter segments in that, those major arteries will be normal. None. They will all have plaque in them. Now, I'm not even putting thrombus in here. This is just by plaque alone. So about a third of the coronary tree, and if you add up the centimeters here, that's about 27 centimeters. That means nine out of 27 centimeters are severely narrowed when that patient presents with the first myocardial infarction. And this is why I'm not so concerned about the little plaque. The plaque with a lot of lipid in it has got that little fibrous capsule on top of it. When you've got nine centimeters of artery that are severely narrowed by plaque alone, now which of these little five millimeter segments you're gonna pick out as a bone the plaque? Uh, about 70 to 75 percent of the plaque here is, is connected tissue. 
Uh, well, this is based on a study of uh, originally 22 patients and then later 35 with unstable angina. Now, it's very hard to study unstable angina at knee crops. How many patients have you had in your hospital with unstable angina who died and then had an autopsy that didn't go on to acute myocardial infarction or didn't go on to angioplasty or bypass operation? The angioplasty works by cracking a plaque. Everybody who has coronary bypass, you crack a plaque in order to put a graft in there. Um, at any rate, these were 22 patients in this initial study. Um, uh, and the interesting thing here, they all had normal ejection fractions, normal cardiac indices, and yet they had terrible angina. Uh, one of these 22 was taking 60 nitroglycerin tablets a day. But look at this. Nearly half of these segments here were narrowed over 75% cross-sectional area. Nearly half. And this is unstable angina, good, good myocardial function. And the unstable angina, when I'm, somebody takes me through a coronary care unit, I see somebody with unstable angina, I put up a red, red flag. In general, they have by far the worst narrowing of all. Uh, the frequency of left main narrowing of significance is much higher in unstable angina than any other group. Now what about healed myocardial infarction? Well, we looked at this in two different ways. We took one group of patients who had large infarcts, and after healing of the infarct, they had chronic congestive heart failure, and indeed they went on to die from congestive heart failure. We contrasted the findings in them to another group who had relatively small infarcts. And after healing of the infarct, they never again had clinical evidence of myocardial ischemia. And indeed, they died from non-cardiac conditions. So these people had small infarcts. It really didn't interfere with their life too much. These people had large infarcts, and they were dyspnic all the time and died from failure. Now, what about the coronary arteries? Which group has the worst coronary artery narrowing by plaque? Or is there any difference? Well, when we looked at that, and if you're going to compare, I can tell you, if you're going to compare morphologically one group with another group, you've got to look at the entire coronary tree. You can't pick out just five areas to look at. You need to look at the whole tree. And what we found here is the percent of segments now are 76 to 100 percent, 29 percent here, 31 percent here, and all these other categories were the same. So what I'm saying is that the size of an infarct it, it does not give you a, a differential clue regarding the amount of so-called plaque burden, the amount of plaque uh, there. Now, when I was an intern, we didn't have coronary care units. And I remember a patient, the two patients, this was Boston City Hospital, one was in this bed, one was in this bed. And, uh, and uh, uh, we were making water around one day, and. Uh, rounding fellow said, well, this fellow just had a small heart attack. He's going to be all right. Sure, Mom. Sure. Uh, don't forget that. Uh, a third of that coronary tree is severely narrow. From the standpoint of the coronary arteries, there's no such thing as a small heart attack. No such thing. Now, if you look at this uh, quantitatively a little bit, uh, uh, and ask if you take patients with fatal coronary events. And let's say this is the size of the box that blood flows through in the four major arteries, left main, left anterior descending, left circumflex, and right. This is the amount of space blood can flow through. And if you look at the group with fatal coronary disease, it turns out the statisticians incidentally don't like us to do this. So you have to take this with a little grain of salt. Uh, but at any rate, uh, about 65% uh, of the lumen is obliterated by plaque alone. Uh, we had controls for these studies, and about a third in the controls. So it's a lot of plaque. Now this is one of these uh, montages of coronary arteries. Uh, each one of these uh, sections represents a single section through a five millimeter segment. Now this happens to be a patient with unstable angina. Now, uh, let's go down the right. 
Now, the point here is you don't find any five millimeter segment that's normal. You know, people say, this patient has three vessel disease. This patient has diffuse coronary disease. This is a diabetic. This, therefore, diffuse coronary disease, non-diabetic, non-diffuse. All that's funk, in my view. If you've got symptomatic coronary disease, you've got, if you've got symptomatic myocardial ischemia, you have extensive and diffuse atherosclerosis in these epicardial coronary arteries, period. Now this was unstable angina. Look at the left main, terribly narrow. Look at the left anterior descending all the way out to here. Now where are you gonna blow a balloon? Here, 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 here. Uh, well, look at here. This little fellow right there is okay. Really, it's all right. Left circumflex with the dominant artery here. Look at that plaque. All the way out. Brown stuff represents fibrous tissue. Uh, fibrous tissue is the dominant component of plaques in patients with symptomatic atherosclerosis. Now, what is this? Now, what I've talked about so far is patients with fatal coronary disease. Now, you might say, well, Robert, uh, I'm not seeing patients with fatal coronary disease. I'm seeing patients with symptomatic disease. I see them in the emergency room with acute myocardial infarction, and they, or they walk into my office, and they give me a story of angina. Surely, they don't have as much narrowing as you're talking about at all times. Okay? Uh, how can we study a patient during life the same way we study a patient at all times. Well, that's pretty hard to do. But uh, when I was at NIH, we had a surgeon, Chuck McIntosh, who often did an endotorectomy on the right coronary artery in a patient he did a bypass on. And now in Dallas, we have another surgeon, uh, Lonnie Witten, who uh, usually does an endotorectomy of the right coronary artery when he does, puts a bypass in that right coronary artery. So what we have here is an endotorectomy from the right coronary artery in one of these patients having a bypass. This is the ostium of the right coronary artery, and this is a little posterior descending branch. Now all, all that stuff is the inside of the artery. Now notice, plaque is everywhere. It doesn't skip, it's not normal. Not like that angiogram, you know, you've got an area of narrow, and then it looks great, and then you got another little down, or a little bit of regularity. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Now, we can take this endotorectomy specimen and fix it in formaldehyde and decalcify it and cut it into little five millimeter segments and compare it to the right coronary artery in patients with fatal coronary disease. And guess what? The amount of narrowing in this endotorectomy specimen is virtually identical to that in patients with fatal cases. So what does that mean? It means, I think, that when that first symptom of myocardial ischemia occurs, you're looking at somebody with severe quantities of plaque in those coronary arteries. So that's why I've become sort of a preventive guy. Uh, you know, cardiology, cardiac surgeons treat the wrecks. Now the question is, how can we prevent the wrecks from occurring in the first place? Uh, now does any of this quantitative stuff have any clinical significance? Well, as sort of already implied, it makes one a bit of a cynic, I think. Uh, it makes one very careful in interpreting for example, uh, how do we interpret angiograms? We've already been through this, but you compare an area of narrowing to an adjacent area, which is assumed to be normal. So if this is 50% of this, that's a so-called 50% lesion. I don't like that word lesion. It implies there's a lesion here and no lesion anywhere else. Folks, there are lesions everywhere when you do an angiogram in somebody with symptomatic myocardial ischemia. So, so one's got to be careful. If I had symptomatic myocardial ischemia, I'd want an angiogram. Uh, I think it's the best thing uh, going. Uh, I think intravascular ultrasonic image is better, but you can't do that um, quite as easily, quite as uh, readily. 
throughout the whole system. Uh, this is the real world. You're comparing an area of narrowing to an adjacent area, which is assumed to be normal, but simply less narrow. That's the real world. Uh, what about in the patient to have bypass operation? Uh, this is a coronary angiogram uh, in someone with, with unstable angina who had uh, severe narrowing of the LAD and of the left circumflex system. Now, this patient is going to have a bypass operation. Uh, would you put a bypass conduit in that artery? There's a little irregularity around. Uh, at any rate, it was decided that this patient didn't need a conduit in that right artery. And I'm not sure that decision was wrong. But the reason I show it is simply to point out that, you know, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. But if you, unfortunately, this patient didn't make it. And uh, three days later, these slides were prepared. That's, that's a half centimeter from the aortic ostium. That's one centimeter from the aortic ostium. These are one section per five millimeter segments. Now what this shows is that every five millimeter section, segment has atherosclerotic plaque in it. Every one. There are no exceptions to that. Every one, despite the fact that angiographically it looked pretty doggone good. Now why did it look good? It looked good because the lumen stretched from one diameter to the other. So, so that makes the angiogram look quite good. And I'm not saying these arteries here are significantly narrow. This one would come out some. Uh, you've got to have over 75% cross-sectional narrowing to be significant. Down here at 8.5, this will come out a little bit. But that would bother me uh, right there. Uh, we did a study on that, the study of the amount of narrowing in native arteries which were not bypassed compared to those that were bypassed. And the quantity of plaque is roughly the same. Now let me switch gears. Now how are we gonna prevent this disease, which is killing about half the people in the developed world? Uh, now when I say shifting gears from decreasing risk uh, to actual prevention and arrest, what I mean is, is that we don't have to have atherosclerosis. Uh, we're not going to go to our doctor, and that doctor's not going to tell us how to prevent it, but we know how to prevent it. Um, we all know how to prevent it. Uh, are we willing, willing to prevent it? I mean, the pediatricians don't talk in terms, of, well, let's decrease the risk of measles, mumps, and newborn They talk about let's prevent it. All the focus on atherosclerosis, it seems to me, is decreasing risk. My God, I don't want to decrease my risk. I, don't, I just don't want to have it. Uh, and I don't think we have to have it. Now, when I go to a cocktail party and somebody comes up to me and says, Doctor, what causes hardening of the arteries? I don't say, well, it's this multifactorial disease. It's too big for any of us who can't get a handle on it. I say, ma'am or sir, what is your cholesterol level? Uh, this is atherosclerosis, in my view, is a cholesterol problem. And uh, uh, it seems to me that as long as our, if, if our LDL is less than 100, if our total cholesterol is less than 150, our chances of developing much plaque is relatively small. Uh, so we all have to decide, do we want it or do we not want it? And if we don't want it, we've got to have that LDL less than 100. Maybe it has to be less than 80, but certainly it has to be less than 100. Now things like blood, high blood pressure, uh, all these things, if the total cholesterol, if the LDL is over 100, these things make it worse. But if the LDL is 90 or 80, there's no evidence as far as I know, that these factors here are atherogenic. None. You can't produce atherosclerotic plaques by cigarette smoking. If you smoke cigarettes and your total cholesterol is 110, it's not going to produce a plaque. If your total cholesterol is 200 and you smoke cigarettes, you've got a major problem. It accelerates. But there are add-ons. They are indirect atherosclerotic risk factors. The only direct one is the cholesterol. 
Now, our population of adults, as you know, uh, over 20 in this country have total cholesterol now averaging about 212. Uh, most of the world, we have 6 billion people on planet Earth, and 4.5 billion the adults, uh, uh, the total cholesterol average is about 150. Atherosclerosis is a problem only in the developed world. Atherosclerotic plaques come with money. Uh, the more money a society has, the more plaques they have. It's a money problem. This is a slide that has to do with percent of our population with total cholesterol is greater than 240. Now, uh, in 1980, that was considered if it was under 240 normal. Well, we know that's crazy. Uh, 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 just as many women die from the consequences of atherosclerosis as do men. Men get the plaques earlier. Uh, here, uh, men 35, 44, a much higher frequency of these high numbers. But look here. After menopause, uh, women, nearly 40% of women in this country have total cholesterol greater than 240. Menopause is a dangerous time. Uh, and you notice that they go down in men. It may be that, that those with the higher levels earlier on are not available uh, out here to be studied. Obviously, total cholesterol is it equals the LDL plus the HDL plus the VLDL. Uh, I show this to point out that the LDL is about 100 uh, until we're 20. Actually, in boys, it starts going up right at puberty. And then it's higher than in women until after menopause, and then women have higher LDL levels than men. HDL, on the other hand, is about the same all of our lives, uh, and women a little higher than men. What are the evidences that atherosclerosis is due to a cholesterol problem? I mean, if I had to go to court uh, and, and give the evidence to the 12 jurors that cholesterol was the problem, I'd line up these six factors here, uh, plus the LDL receptor story by Brown and Goldstein. I think the evidence is overwhelming uh, connecting cholesterol to atherosclerosis. Now this is Ansel Key's famous Seven Nations study. Uh, this was the first multi-center study that I'm aware of. Uh, it was done in the 1960s. Certainly it was the first international study. Uh, it was the first study that had a central laboratory to read electrocardiograms, uh, uh, cholesterol levels, and so on. It's really a great study. Ansel Keys, incidentally, is still alive. I think he's 97, living on the French Riviera. I understand he's, he's healthy. He's been uh, a rare media most of his life, I understand. But at any rate, this study shows certain countries, Japan and so on, very low frequency of symptomatic coronary disease, USA film, very high frequency. What did Ansel Keys conclude? He said it was a cholesterol problem. In southern Japan, very narrow bell-shaped curve. Average total cholesterol is 150. East Finland, it was 280. That data was collected in the uh, in the 1960s. The Mr. Fitz study uh, also, I think, is a very fine study. Uh, why? Look how many people were studied, over 350,000. They were all men uh, aged 35 to 57. They were divided into 10 groups according to their serum total cholesterol. And what it shows very nicely is that number goes up, 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 and up. The coronary mortality, whether it's 6, 10, 12, 15 years, goes up, up, and up. So cholesterol number is a quantity. The higher the quantity, the greater the risk. The higher the quantity, the greater the frequency of symptomatic atherosclerosis. The greater the chance of dying from it. And thirdly, the greater the quantity of plaque at autopsy. It all makes sense. Now, how can we change our levels by what we put in our mouths? Uh, we all read about cholesterol. When I was in medical school, I don't recall a single lecture on nutrition. None, zero. Uh, when I graduated from medical school, I didn't know the caloric count of a single food. I knew nothing about nutrition. I ate like them terribly, often. Uh, now, when it comes to cholesterol, cholesterol is easy. It comes from animals and their products. So if we don't eat animals, we don't take in cholesterol. Now I say that, yet I walk in a grocery store and walk by the peanut butter counter and 
And this file says, uh, container says, no cholesterol here. Oh, of course. It's a peanut. It's not an animal. And so cholesterol comes only from animals. And most of us now in the U.S. take in only about 300 or 400 milligrams of cholesterol every day. Milligrams! Not even enough to get a calorie out of it. You can't even hardly see it. Two major sources. Eggs, the visible and non-visible ones we eat, nearly half, and cows are the rest. We call it beef, it's really a bovine muscle, and that's about 28%, and then milk is nine, and cheese is five, and butter is four. So if we give up eggs, and if we give up cows, we have beat the cholesterol problem. I can tell you that a toothpick weighs about 100 milligrams. Most of us take in only a, the equivalency of about three uh, three and a half toothpicks of cholesterol every day. Now what about fat? Fat's the villain. Uh, we take in in this country an average of about 140 grams. Now we're talking about grams, not milligrams, of fat every day. I can tell you a deck of carbs weighs about 75 grams. That should be our absolute max. If we could get that down to 50 grams a day, our health would uh, skyrocket. Uh, fat's an interesting thing. When we take in fat, of course, we take it in through these triglyceride particles. And every fatty acid has all three components. Uh, there's no such thing as a pure saturated fatty acid or pure monounsaturated. It's which one is predominant. Uh, uh, the saturated ones predominantly raise our cholesterol levels, uh, the total and the LDL. The mono and the polyunsaturated either the lower them or they have a neutral effect. Now the S here means solid at room temperature. So if you've got grease in a skillet and it's solid at room temperature, it's saturated. Butter, for example, solid at room temperature, it's saturated. Uh, Grundy has a lot of evidence that monounsaturated is better for us than poly. And monounsaturated, the biggest one is olive oil, over 75% of monounsaturated. Uh, I've never quite understood how saturated fatty acids raise our cholesterol levels. As you know, cholesterol are these benzene rings, whereas fatty acid are carbon chains covered with hydrogen atoms. Now, how do you take that and raise our cholesterol level? It beats me. Uh, it, it's saturated when all carbon atoms are covered by hydrogen. When only one is missing, it's monounsaturated. You have more than one, it's, it's poly. <coughs> but I've asked many nutritionists now, many experts in the field of nutrition, how do saturated fatty acids raise our cholesterol level? And as best I can tell, nobody really knows, but it does. If you want to get a good grease job in a hurry, there's no better place than the fast food chain. McDonald's puts up one new outlet every three days somewhere around the world. And every time they do, the cows moan and groan. If you think of the Holocaust going on out there, just, just ask the cows about that. Now, there are two people in Washington, D.C. that go around every five years to try to determine the ingredients of the fast food uh, industry. The King Hamburger at the moment is Carl's Jr. Double Western Bacon Cheeseburger. Now that's a little over a thousand calories in that single hamburger. You squeeze it real hard and come up with about 14 or 15 teaspoons in that single hamburger. The Department of Agriculture tells us that our daily value for sodium, this is not salt, this is sodium alone, should be no more than 1,800 milligrams. Well, good calls, Jimmy, will give you the whole daily value right there in the single hamburger. I'll have the half pound double of Lux bacon steer burger, please. You want chemotherapy with that? I think that's the truth. Now, there, most of us, or many of us, think we're carnivores, but folks, there's a lot of difference between carnivores and herbivores. Uh, when you look down at your appendages, do you see claws? No. We've got hands or hoofs. Uh, the, the carnivores have sharp teeth, except for two. Uh, our teeth are flat for grinding. The intestinal tract of a carnivore is very short. You give your dog or cat something to eat, they gotta go outside in a few minutes. The intestinal tract of a carnivore is three times body length. The intestinal tract of an herbivore is 12 times 
When we cool our body, uh, we sweat. Carnivores have no capacity to sweat. When we drink water, we sip it, they lap it. Vitamin C, they make it themselves. We, of course, obtain it from our diet. I think the health of this nation will not improve until we quit demanding flesh 21 meals a week. If we could knock that down to five or seven, think what that would do uh, to the health of this nation. And I believe very strongly that the medical profession should lead the parade. Uh, if you look at diseases that uh, pure vegetarians over many decades don't get, it's pretty striking, atherosclerosis is not a problem, high blood pressure is not a problem. Look here, lady, cancer of the breast, cancer of the colon, prostate gland, type 2 diabetes, they're not obese. Uh, constipation is usually not a problem. Transit time is very quick in the vegetation, vegetarian. Hemorrhoids, uh, diverticulitis, appendicitis, hyal hernia, gallstones, kidney stones. Look at this, ladies, osteoporosis. So can we change our health? Of course we can change our health. Uh, during World War II, there were certain countries, four are listed here, three are listed here, uh, they didn't have much butter during that period of time, and not much cheese, and not much milk, and not much flesh to eat. And what happened to the cardiovascular death rate? Well, in, in Sweden it fell, in Finland it fell, in Norway boom, it fell. The USA just kept on going up. Can we change our health? Of course we can. This slide has to do with cancer of breast. But we have one of the highest frequencies of cancer of the breast in the world. On the horizontal axis here is the fat consumed per gram by adults in various countries around the world. Here we are about 140 grams of fat a day. And we have one of the highest frequencies of cancer of the breast in the world. Now this could also be cancer of the colon. It could also be, be systemic hypertension, high blood pressure. And of course, it could be atherosclerosis. The lower the quantity of fat consumed by any society, the lower the frequency of our two most common cardiovascular conditions and two of the three most common cancers. Well, what about diet? Uh, the most commonly prescribed diet by, you know, by physicians in the USA is a 30% of calories from fat diet. So if we go from 40% of calories to 30%, what does that do to our total and LDL cholesterol level? Well, Hunting Hacking Group has shown us that it lowers total cholesterol on average of 5%. It lowers LDL on average of 5%. Now, if you want to really lower cholesterol levels by diet alone, we've got to be down here at 20%. And then that gives about a 20% reduction uh, in total and LDL cholesterol level. Uh, vegetarians are down here at 10%. We wouldn't need all these drugs if we were all uh, vegetarians. Uh, now the statin drugs, and I have no stocks in any pharmaceutical companies, uh, statin drugs to me are miracle drugs. Uh, they are to atherosclerosis what penicillin was to infectious disease. Now the statin drug, the uh, lowest statin of memorable, came out of this nation in 1987. Uh, and here, so we've had them for 13 years. They're the most under-prescribed miracle drug that has ever hit, uh, that's for sure. I think the statin drugs are by far the best cardiovascular drug that's ever been created. And yet, uh, and until relatively recently, uh, the statin drug was one of the last ones used in the cardiologic our armamentarium. Now these are the formulas of the six statin drugs available in this country. These are the natural statins and, and the formulas are pretty similar here. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, synthetic statins, the formulas are quite different among themselves and they're also quite different uh, from the uh, uh, natural statins. I used to say that despite this differences in formulas, there was nothing uh, really strongly to suggest that there were differences among these various uh, drugs. Uh, but I've, I've changed my mind on that and I'll come back to that. These are the uh, five trials that have shown beyond any reasonable doubt uh, 
that statin drugs given either before a heart attack or after a heart attack decrease the risk of a first or second heart attack. Uh, uh, you can notice here that the drugs used in these double-blind controlled studies, you, you can't do a double-blind controlled study anymore with these drugs. It's, it's, it's malpractice. A provostatin PP, and that's all 40 milligrams, so if you're going to use provostatin, you've got to use 40 milligrams if you want to get these results. The other one is lovastatin, and the other one is simvastatin or, or so forth. Uh, the reason I show this is simply to point out uh, the percent LDL reduction. I think that's a, that's a column to focus on, and that's this column here. Uh, and what turns out that the percent LDL reduction you get, that's about the relative risk reduction you, one is going to get. Now the relative risk means the difference between events in the placebo group and the prevent and the events in the statin group. So that 34 percent is a difference between. 27.9% here and 19.4%. That's a relative risk reduction. So what I'm saying is that if you have a patient in your office or in a hospital and they just had a heart attack or not, if you put them on this drug and uh, you, you can tell them that this drug has the capacity to lower your LDL so much, whatever percent it lowers that LDL, that's the percent reduction you ought to get in the next five years in having a first heart attack or a second heart attack. That's pretty impressive. And look at all these studies. Uh, this is the LDL achieved. There was only one study that got the LDL to less than 100. And it happens that was the study that started with the lowest baseline LDL. So now we can get we can get these LDLs much lower than 112 or 122 or 113 or 159, much lower than that. So the relative risk reduction should be much more than have been achieved in these trials. As you know, in these trials, it's, it's uh, intention to treat analysis. So, so some of the people taking the drug and in the drug group quit taking the drug you know, after a year, or after a day. Now, this is the six statin drugs available. This is cerubostatin or Baycol, atorvastatin, Lipitor, simvastatin or Zocor, lovastatin or Mevacor, provastatin, Provacol, fluvastatin or Lescol. And Lescol was named correctly. That means less effective. Uh, <laughs> now, these are the equivalent milligram doses. Uh, now, the two big ones, of course, are atorvastatin and simvastatin. So that's a two-to-one ratio there. So you adjust for e efficacy. Five milligrams, it's not available in five, is equivalent to 10 milligrams of Zocor. Now, with these equivalent milligram doses, one could, should expect a 22% average reduction in total and a 27% average reduction in LDL where it's switching from a 40% to a 30% of fat diet, you get a 5% reduction. Uh, here, you can get a 27% uh, reduction at these, uh, at these small doses. Uh, now, this is a liver enzyme elevation greater than three times the upper limit of normal. That's one out of 400 people. These are some of the safest drugs that have come down the pipe. We're publishing an article, well, it's actually come out in a symposium showing that possibly these statin drugs have very little to do with uh, liver enzyme elevation. Uh, now, the point of this slide, if you double the dose, let's say you double, uh, this, most people on a torvastatin are on 10, now most people on simvastatin or Zocor are on 20. Uh, now, when you double the dose, you get a 5% additional reduction in total and a 7% additional reduction in LDL. In other words, this is the rule of five and this is the rule of seven and liver enzyme increase doubles. Uh, uh, so, so with these higher doses, let's say uh, 40 milligrams of atorvastatin, 80 milligrams of Zocor, you get a 37% reduction on the average in total and nearly a 50% average reduction in LDL and the 
two out of a hundred people have enzyme elevation. Now, that's a miracle, a 50% reduction in LDL, 50%. None of the trials achieve that, but you can achieve that in your patients. Uh, I mean, this, this, this is incredible. Um, there have been three studies now. If you compare these higher doses of atorvastatin at 20, uh, uh, Zocor or Simvastatin at 40, and uh, Torvastatin at 40, and Simvastatin at 80. Compare those higher doses. Uh, HDL reduction uh, increase is significantly higher with Simvastatin than with Zocor. At the lower doses, the elevation of uh, HDL in all these drugs is about the same. It's about a six or seven percent increase, which is about a three milligram per deciliter increase. At the higher doses, similar, and particularly in the patients with HDLs less than 35, simvastatin at the 80 dose raises HDL about 17 percent. Atorvastatin at 40 does not raise it. Uh, a torvastatin at 20 uh, raises HDL about uh, 7%. A tor uh, Zocor at 40 raises about uh, 13%. So at the higher doses, those are three studies that have shown that, uh, um, semvastatin is, is better than uh, a torvastatin. At the lower doses, as mentioned earlier, uh, there are no differences. Now Merck's done something clever, I think, and that is to uh, uh, fixed price of 20, 40, and 80. And uh, uh, that is, you can get an 80 milligram tablet for the same cost as a 20 milligram tablet. Now what I tell people is to buy the 80. And, and the 20 and the 40 are triangular pills. You can't cut them. But you can, you can readily cut, I don't know if you work people like me to say this, but, but you can readily cut that 80 milligram tablet. And so you can use it as 240s. And, and that's by far the least expensive way uh, to handle these drugs with the higher doses. Uh, I believe the LDL target for everybody should be less than 100, everybody. Uh, so that I don't, I don't like to subdivide patients into primary prevention and secondary prevention. I don't believe in the guidelines. Uh, I think they're bunk. I, my, my view is why should we talk about decreasing risk when we don't have to. We can talk about elimination of this process and arresting of the process. Uh, but if we're going to talk in those terms, we've got to get that LDL uh, to less than 100. Now by guidelines, um, LDL less than 100, that, uh, that's in the guidelines only for people who've had a heart attack. In my view, if it's good to get an LDL less than 100 after a heart attack, Surely it must be good to get an LDL less than 100 before heart attack. So that's my view. Secondly, I think one should start people on the dose that does the job. I don't believe in a start any any particular uh, dose is a starting dose. Let's say let's say you've got a patient with an LDL of 180, and you want to get it down to 100 or less. You've got to have a 45 percent reduction. So I believe in starting people. If you want a 45% reduction, you start them right here. Start them on 20 of the torvastatin or 40 of simvastatin, or start them on 40 of the torvastatin or 80 of simvastatin. Start them on the dose that does the job. Uh, is it important to treat triglycerides? Uh, the most important thing is to lower LDL. The next most important thing is to raise HDL. And the third most important thing is to lower triglycerides. Why? The BLDL remnants have some atherogenic particles within them. If you measure only LDL, you don't pick those up. Uh, secondly, when the triglyceride level is elevated, usually the HDL is down. Uh, the LDL particles are small and dense rather than large and buoyant. Number three, and this sort of blows my mind, is that people with elevated triglyceride levels, uh, that's a pro-coagulant state. So these people are clotters. 
Their platelet aggravability is increased, their fibrinogen levels are increased, their plasminogen activator inhibitors are increased, etc. And maybe the most important of all, uh, they usually have the metabolic syndrome or the insulin resistance syndrome. They have this lipid triad, which is here. Uh, they have a procoagulant state, they have high blood pressure as a rule, they have uh, increased insulin levels, they are insulin resistant, uh, they're almost always obese, they have a higher glucose level than normal. Their frequency of diabetes is much higher than, than in others. So there are many reasons uh, to treat, the, the, uh, to get those triglycerides down. Triglycerides, as you know, with statin drugs are baseline dependent. So if you have a triglyceride of 100, the statin drugs are probably not going to change it at all. If your triglyceride level is 400, on the other hand, it may knock it down 40%. So my view is to go with a statin drug, and then if you don't get the triglycerides far enough down, or if you don't get the HDL far enough up, add a fibrate or add a, a niacin. Now this is data from Hefna from uh, uh, San Antonio. And this is the basis of, of treating patients with diabetes who, all, with a statin drug. And what Hefna showed, if you, if you take a group of patients who have no diabetes, but they've already had a heart attack. And you follow them for seven years. Uh, they have a chance of another heart attack of about 19%, one out of five. On the other hand, if you take diabetic patients who've never had a heart attack, their chances of having a heart attack in the next seven years is the same as those non-diabetics who've already had a heart attack. I heard a talk recently by a diabetologist talking about, about diabetes. He said the most important drug in diabetes, first is a statin drug, second is an ACE inhibitor, third is an aspirin tablet, and fourth is an anti-glycemic agent. Uh, so it's a, it's a, the diabetics should be looked at as if they've had heart attacks. Uh, I won't go through this, but uh, this data came out about a year ago. Most hyperlipidemic patients are not treated with a lipid-lowering agent. Only 50% of patients who've had a coronary event have ever been on a statin drug. It's a, it's, it, it, it's, a, uh, it's a major problem. What are the factors preventing reaching of the goal? Only 17% of patients who have a coronary event and are on a statin drug have gotten their LDL for less than 100. Uh, generally, the dose is too low. Uh, the second is a non-compliance. Cause 85% of the patients on a statin drug have a third party paying for it. So cost is not the biggest item. In my view, everybody with symptomatic atherosclerosis uh, ought to be on a statin drug, uh, uh, irrespective of which system is involved, qualification. Uh, we, we have a lot of vascular surgery at my institution. To get the vascular surgeons to use statin drugs uh, it has been very difficult. Uh, anybody with a carotid in the ought to be on a statin drug. It, it's crazy. Uh, certainly anybody now with diabetes ought to be on a statin drug. Anybody with familial hypercholesterolemia, and that's one of the biggest reasons for diagnosing the familial variety, only in one out of 500 people. A diet is not going to do the job there, no matter what diet uh, one is on. Okay, lights on. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Uh, all the previous trial, regarding primary for 